Yeah. Sweet. Okay. So, official introduction for the recording. Hi, my name. Uh, I am the noble Rose Achembo. I'm from the East Kingdom. Uh, got my A away, but that's a non-binary title for that. I figured out. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and this informal presentation um, is just talking about accessibility on the list field specifically in rapier, but hopefully um, crossover in between heavy combat and maybe even um, uh, heavy uh, archery in heavy combat that I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, but so yeah. First thing uh, I kind of want to touch on is I use a wheelchair um, most of the time for long distance. So I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user, uh, which means I've had the experience of fencing in like act in a melee um, and in a rose tourney and in singles, both from my wheelchair and from standing. So I have a little bit of a unique perspective on the differences and especially with opponents and how they take it and how they want to fight it as well. I've talked to a couple of other people. Well, I say a couple, like two other people who also use wheelchairs um, and are fencing as well. And I found some common threads, but the rules specifically aren't, you know, we have to look at the rules and be like, okay, then this fits in here to make sure that we're still following the rule book but also being able to do it ourselves. Um, so one of the things is rule standardization, um, or at least a base that people can go off of to make it more accessible for them. So I found that a lot of marshals don't know what to do with you if you're in a wheelchair and you're fencing. Um, at the Rose Tourney I fought in, in at Great West last year, I, had I was talking to my opponents and some of them wanted to fight me like I was like do you want to fight standing or sitting and like the marshals didn't really know so I had to take it on and be like okay this is how I fight this is like my opponent can do whatever they want they can fight from sitting on a stool or in a chair um opposite me and we can just fight dual sitting or they can stand and I'm just sitting like uh, stagnant I guess is the right word for it um and it was interesting seeing how other people's like perspectives and how they tried to adapt to it as well like one of the opponents I was fighting didn't feel comfortable enough fighting me standing because they thought it was an unfair advantage even though I was like no you can do whatever you want whatever makes you more comfortable um but having maybe a standardized set of rules that are like okay if your opponent has to fight sitting maybe not even in a wheelchair but like they have mobility issues or they have a prosthetic leg and they can't or like an injured hip or ankle or knee then they can fight from a stool or a folding chair or something and having a set of rules that are like hey this person can't move so they're in a singular spot so the rules of their opponent and how to adapt to that that way they're not getting an unfair advantage or they don't feel uncomfortable with fighting someone else um like one of the things that i found was if you're going to fight someone from a sitting position you have to make sure and they're standing you have to go over okay this is my furthest range of how far i can hit you from the farthest distance you have to stay in this range or else it is unfair because you can just back out of the fight and i can't move anywhere um and in melees i have fought one mostly standing but what I found and what I've spoke to another uh, rapier fighter who uses a wheelchair, um, though he uses an electric wheelchair, is one of the ways that you can do it if you're an ambulatory wheelchair user and able to stand at least a little bit, is you take your wheelchair up to the engagement line, then you park it and go standing on the engagement line until you are killed um, or the battle's over. And then you go back to your wheelchair and you use that for the long distances. Though I have seen pictures of people in both heavy combat and in rapier 
of someone who is like completely paralyzed or can't stand at all, they'll have someone who's pushing their chair, who is basically their legs. Um, and so if that person gets killed, you know, it's an extra obstacle, but if that person gets killed, then you're stuck in your same, uh, same spot, same as if you're legged, you know, but that person then takes on your legs and becomes them basically so that they'll push you around so you have both hands free instead of, you know, man managing five different things at once. Um, I've seen... I don't know her name, but I've seen a couple, uh, I've seen this one specific wheelchair user. There's a picture of her on the, I believe the SVA page on Penzik where she's a mainly wheelchair user and she did that kind of um, accessibility for the uh, melees. Um, and the difference for you know, someone who can't move as much compared to someone who is completely mobile and can be like jumping around and, you know, dodging attacks all of a sudden. And then someone who like, if they're in a wheelchair, depending on how high the back on the wheelchair is, you can't lean backwards in it. You basically have to, you can only lean side to side, you can't go backwards and you can only go forwards. And sometimes if like, say a person's paralyzed or they have really bad core instability, then it's sometimes even harder for that. So finding a standard set of rules that we can be like, okay, if a person is in a wheelchair um, or they need to fight from sitting down, then these are the base rules. And then everyone can kind of go off of that within the guidelines and be like, okay, so this doesn't work for me, but this does, but it might work for someone else. And having more of a standardization and an understanding of more marshals not just in rapier, but in heavy combat as well, about how to approach these situations instead of just being like in the dark, not having a clue and putting all the like responsibility and explanation on the person who is like in the wheelchair or having to fight from sitting um, to explain to everyone, you know, if it's like in attorney, then you have to explain not only to that marshal, but the marshal that's monitoring your next fight and then also all your opponents, therefore. So having just a basic set of rules that could be like, this is the baseline. I might have a couple specifications that work specifically for me, but that way everyone can have an understanding and a base level of knowledge instead of just being like, I don't know how to handle this. This is completely new and I'm not comfortable with fighting you because I don't want you to get injured you can be like okay no this is like all like for instance in an example from mine um one of the people i was fighting an attorney he was really understanding and everything but he didn't know how to exactly like fight from a chair or like fight from sitting or the other way we did it with one of my other opponents was they just they could like lunge a little bit, but their feet were basically rooted to the spot. They could adjust their footing, but they couldn't step forward or backward. They could just lean kind of the same way I was. Um, and using like weapons that are like, you're not gonna fight someone if you're stagnant from a wheelchair when you have a short, a single sword or a sword and a dagger or dual daggers, you're not gonna fight someone with a long sword or her like a spear. So having the understanding that like certain opponents can, you know, fight each other with certain weapons because of the ability that like, unless you have someone pushing you who's your legs, you can't move out of the way or move in to engage or to disengage and having more of a, again, face level of understanding. Um, I, I also kind of want to touch on working in rules for other disabilities, not just, you know, wheelchairs and uh, mobility disabilities. For instance, um, my dad's losing his hearing. So he has hearing aids, but he can't fight with them on. So we've learned to adapt. Um, and he's been fencing more than fighting heavy recently because he tore his ACL. Um, but having the understanding with marshals of being like, hey, so I'm hard of hearing. I might not be able to hear you if you yell hold. So just make a hand sign or 
make sure that the people around me, like he'll notify people who are fighting around him and sometimes in a melee specifically. And if it's one-on-one, -on -one, he'll notify his opponent um, being like, hey, I'm hard of hearing. If I don't hear it, you either need to like tap me or give me some kind of signal so that I can know that a hold is called it, whether it be medical or anything else. Um, and we've kind of learned, well, where he'll have one of his friends or like a family member or something on the sidelines, that way that they can also be the kind of like, not interpreter, but just being like, uh, I guess advocate in, in case something goes wrong or someone doesn't understand something, but having a base level, again, base level of rules and understanding for marshals who have been authorized or uh, reauthorized to marshal being like, hey, so if this kind of situation comes up, here's what you should do, but ask the person that it is um, pertaining to what they feel most comfortable doing and what they feel is the best accommodations for them. Uh, and I guess that could also work for visually visual impairments as well, depending on the situation. Though I don't know, other than like base glasses, I don't know many people who fight who have a visual impairment because it is a pretty severe disadvantage, but same kind of way where we can take inspiration from like, um, like disability sports and like in the Paralympics, they have disability fencing. So taking inspiration from that to get maybe a base set of rules and regulations and, you know, understanding for the marshals specifically to be able to let more people doing it without having to push hard and really fight to be able to. Um, I, I'm pretty lucky where when I got authorized for fencing, the marshals who were doing the authorization were very understanding. Actually, one of the people who co-signed on it also fought from a wheelchair, so I kind of glided through it with that. But giving, especially authorizing marshals, an understanding that if they have mobility issues and they can walk a little, make them authorized while standing and doing normal fighting if they feel up to it that day, and then make them authorized for sitting. Like that's how I was authorized. Um, that way you can make sure they're safe doing it both sitting and standing because it is very different where you can be very quick on your feet and darting around a hand, you know, advancing and um, disengaging very quickly if you're standing. If you're in a wheelchair and you're powering it yourself and you don't have someone who will push you around or something, it's a very different experience when you're rooted to the spot and all you can do is just lean or like lightly lunge or something um, compared, comparatively, I guess would be the best word for it. And knowing that as well as like for hearing and visual stuff it is difficult because there are all certain things where like if you can't hear someone yell hold then that is a safety issue but at the same time there can be ways around it like how you see in you know sports normally where they make accommodations for people who are blind or deaf completely and they have someone where it's like a flashing light will signify you know the end of a round in like basketball or something or like how in wrestling it's the most similar sport i guess to what we do but in wrestling um in the paralympics for people who are deaf they'll have like a physical um, like reminder or a light will flash brightly in the area so that they can see it and know that, oh, the round's done, I've won or lost, whatever that is, or if it's a medical hold or people who are heavily visually impaired, they'll have a sound, whether it be like a bell ringing or like I know in basketball, um, they'll have some kind of beeping near the hoop, but in uh, visually impaired um, wrestling, they'll make sure that you have to be like contact with your opponent at first. So I know s there's a couple people who I've talked to um, who fought visually impaired, whether they had an injury on one of their eyes. Um, so they had limited 
uh, visibility or something similar, or they had to fight and they didn't have contacts, so they couldn't wear their glasses or something like that. Um, on their opponent, they would like, specifically in heavy combat, they would touch their sword to the person's shield or vice versa. And so that they knew this is the range that I have and know where to hit and things like that. Um, I'm trying to think, what else? Um, I know for my personal experiences, which is mostly just what, what I'm running off of because there's not a huge community of people who fight um, either heavy or in fencing who are disabled. I mean, there's a good handful, but it's not as talked about. Like I've only met one or two other people who fight from a wheelchair. I've seen pictures of maybe three or four more, but it's very selective, I guess, in who I can go to for information on it. And so what I found that works for me is specifically since I'm a mobile uh, ambulatory wheelchair user, if I'm feeling up to it, I'll fight standing. If I need to, I'll sit down. I've also found that like with melees, I'll use my wheelchair to get up to the front line, maybe have someone push me um, from the back, uh, from behind me and <laughs> make sure that I can get up to that line. And then I'll engage from standing um, and as I said, if I get killed, I'll sit back down in my wheelchair, go back to res or out of bounds um, to make sure everyone's safe. And I'll make sure if, especially melees, if the group I'm fighting with, I'll make sure they know like, hey, here's what's going to happen. Here is the baseline of like how I do this so that they can also be safe and knowing because I've found that some people, if they're not used to fighting around someone who's sitting or they're even not used to being around a wheelchair, they don't know how to interact or move around one as much. Um, and it's especially difficult when you're against 20 other people who are trying to kill you um, <laughs> to be able to keep your head on straight and know how to react in those certain situations. Um, I've also found that one of the one of the things that people especially opponents is sometimes they don't know how to like fight someone who is completely sitting down so maybe that could be a good idea to maybe try and standardize some kind of way of basic knowledge maybe in the rules or something of if you have an opponent who is seated here's the limits and here is the you know, frame of how you're supposed to um, approach a situation like that. Um, and it, I mean, it depends on person to person, whereas like my sword and my dagger, I have very short sword and dagger and it's super light, so I don't dislocate joints, but other people might have a longer sword or longer reach or more mobility or less. So it really needs to have some kind of standardized like hey, this is the base level of rules. You can go forward with however you want, but making it so more people know how to approach situations like that would be a lot more helpful and take care of a lot of the hiccups and bumps in the road in the future, especially if more and more people want to start fencing or fighting, especially since like if some people are getting older, they might not be able to stand for that period of time, but they still want to fight. They don't want to give it up. So being able to have a standardized way of you can fight from sitting down and here are the guidelines for that would probably help and open up a lot more, you know, make it more accessible for a lot larger range of ages and abilities. But yeah, I think that's, all I really had specifically to talk on, I mean, if you have any questions, I can try and answer them to the best of my abilities, but yeah. Yeah, I tried to take a couple of notes here. Um, when you were talking about kind of like range checks when it comes between people, um, I, I kind of imagine that it's like, you know, if you're in an RPG, you know, 
environment and then you engage right and so you have your grid and it's like well no you're locked in you're engaged now and it's like um so definitely working that idea into it can give people a good parameter of like you know here is now our battle area oh. yeah it uh in the rose tourney it was something similar where there was since i i locked my wheelchair to the spot but since i have a little mobility i scooched forward on the seat so i could lunge a little bit so my range was a lot bigger and not a lot of people can do that i'm very lucky in the mobility i have um but if but it was the same kind of like you have a foot or two that you can move in and still be in my range but if you move out of that we have to pause reset start the fight again um because it is not fair if someone can just take three steps back and then I can't hit them at all. Um, it's different if they're in my range, but leaning to the side or blocking hits um, or leaning back. But as long as their movement is within my capabilities so I can mimic it even from my spot, then it's a lot more fair. Though if they're not being able to match my abilities or my range kind of it's a lot less fair and it wouldn't make for a fair fight or it would impede my ability to win <laughs> or land hits sure like um uh weight classes uh, yeah. the other portion was um you mentioned that one of the things that could help us all with accessibility are definitely the marshals getting familiar with these sets of rules so then it's not always on like that person to have to then educate everybody or set these things up um and i wasn't aware um there's a lot of things that i'm not aware of but uh one of being registered to do fighting while sitting is that a I guess, like, are there people who... There are certain people who do fence from sitting down. I know a couple of the older crowd do it. Um, if they've had, like, knee, knee replacements or hip replacements or something, or if they've had an injury or something like that, they'll fence from, like, a folding stool. Um, I've seen someone who, or I've heard of, not seen firsthand, but of someone who authorized with a rigid parry but the it was one of those folding stool canes so if they needed to they could sit down but it was also their parry weapon so it you know was still within the rights but they couldn't be more mobile with it um though it's not an official thing it's not standardized it's uh right now it's on a kind of case-to-case -case basis um most of the time if you fight from sitting you have to before you fight you have to go to the marshal and be like hey and your opponent be like hey I do this these are the kind of rules and what makes it fair for me um but a lot of people have to stop fighting because they aren't as mobile like they can't walk around as much or carry that armor or make those kinds of moves so if we can kind of standardize or at least get a base set of rules of how to encounter things like that it would probably up accessibility for fighters either who have injuries or are amputees or have been paralyzed or, or just have mobility issues um open it up so they can fight again or start fighting um how would you what do you think the best way of going about doing that is to like stand to, to like start the standardization of, of rules um, through through the DEIB office or through the marshal's office or I think it would be a comp a collaborative effort honestly since it is a marshal issue but it is under the accessibility preview um, maybe getting like make having a bunch of people who fight that way already who fight from sitting or have mobility issues um do like a survey or something of what works for them and what they would like to see because i may be disabled but i don't speak for anyone and my experience vary vastly from even someone who might have my same condition so it's really 
like maybe getting an overview or creating a survey or form or something that people who are disabled, who want to fence or fight even for heavy combat and or who already do or who want to get back into fencing, but they had an, act, uh, an injury or something like that, having them fill out the form so the marshal's office and the DEI office and everything have an idea of what would work and then going from there to create base rules on what is allowed, what isn't, how to approach these situations, how marshals should handle it. And then from there, people can add their own little stipulations um, based on their ability. Great. I mean, I think I'll bring it up with the, well, I think now there's going to be a, there's a new society DEIB person, as well as the <laughs> corporate DEIB person. Um, but I could bring it up with with them because that's probably where it's, you know, to get it everywhere, to get it to happen everywhere, it's got to start, uh, I guess, at the top, right? So yeah. I can talk to them about that and talking to the, you know, have them talk to the marshals. Um, but it, you know, I think it's wonderful that you are talking about this as a younger person. Um, and, you know, I, feel like on the other the other the other age side like people just assume like if they're older and it just had had knee replacement surgery or going to that like that's it I'm done I don't fight anymore right and um you know this this would open things up for a lot of people you know no matter what age you are yeah it's ability. yeah it's like even in the more like, I don't know, more common thing is if a fighter or something gets a leg injury, as long as they don't put weight on it, like let's say someone breaks their ankle, if they use crutches to get to the stool to the fighting zone and they're open about, hey, I'm injured here, don't aim for it, like, or if you aim for it, don't hit the cast, don't do this or that because it'll injure me further. As long as they're safe about it, it could even help people fight um, who would have to take time off as long as they're okay with it and everything. But if they wanna take, you know, they wanna keep doing it, then they would be able to just slightly different. Um, and I know like my dad specifically, and he's one of the other disabled people who I, who is also a knight and fights both heavy and rapier. So I've kind of gone his experiences um, a little bit more, but he stopped fighting heavy um, or he started fencing again after his ACL surgery um, before he started heavy. And he had to make a couple accommodations for that. And so maybe also like standardizing uh, the ability, it's more on a case-to-case -case basis. And I guess it would be considered under personal armor, but like, um, the notion that like, or making it more common for people to like wear a brace or something like that on an injured leg where now it's like people do it, but if it's more of a visible thing, like I know my dad's brace was one of the ones that had like metal pieces on it to help with the knee bend and stuff like that, where if it's more visible and maybe a safety issue, if it got hit directly, um, making it so that there's guidelines in place for these kinds of things where this is allowed up to a certain extent and then from there it falls under a different preview or a different section of the rules um if you have like again say a leg injury and you're wearing a brace for it that if it got hit it would cause damage or injure you or injure the equipment or something well then you have to fight from sitting down you can still do it but you can't take any leg shots from there. So stuff like that. Yeah, the, the healer in me, because I'm an acupuncturist, makes me, th <laughs> makes me think that like acute conditions, like if you, if you hurt your ankle, maybe you should just sit out and wait till that heals. Oh yeah, no, completely. <laughs> but if someone wants, like if it's most likely, but if someone wants to take that chance, it's, it's more up to, I person. guess the individual person right. uh, also depending on how heavily they're injured, but having the option for it to happen yeah. would also open for people who like me, I dislocate things a lot. So I'm constantly getting injured, but I wear braces and all that different kinds of things. And I can't stand or walk far 
uh, for lo long periods of time. So having the base set of rules where this is how you fight from a stool, this is how your opponent should um, like treat you in these certain ways. Here's the grid for like, like in D&D, here's the engagement zone. Here's the engaged uh, in combat and here's disengaged and things like that, where once it's standardized, people can kind of take their own chances and, you know, deal with it however they want to and take those risks, especially if they're injured, but it's there and an option. Uh, thank you. Do you, um, uh, cause I know, like you were saying, it's not like you can be every disabled person in the whole world's <laughs> opinion. But, uh, uh, how do you feel about like heavily marking braces when you do have to wear them? Like, I'm not sure what that accommodation would be, but even if it's like a red sock or something. I feel like it would depend on the person. I'm fine with it. I, you know, some people have, you know, medical trauma where they don't want to, they put on a brace, but then they just want to forget about it and they don't want to have to think about it. Um, but as a safety standpoint, like, like I said, for the braces where if they got hit with a certain level of um, like power or strength, where it would become a safety concern, that might be a good idea. Maybe doing the same thing that they do um, with a different color tape, but they do for youth fighters on the heavy field is you get made to, you have to put a bright yellow diamond of tape on your helmet and on your dominant hand and on the back of your helmet so that fighters um, can know that, hey, this is a youth here um, especially for like medical reasons, if there is to be an incident um, and they need to get parental permission for something um, or for, you know, other fighters to know, hey, this is a kid, like just, you can treat them the same as other fighters, but like be Before aware. Before you mollywop them, be aware. Yeah, basically. <laughs> So maybe something kind of like you said with like a sock over a brace or something, maybe putting like a piece of tape on the brace or making it visible. So like my dad would wear it on the outside of his pants instead of underneath them when he was fencing so that it's visible and you can see it. Um, but maybe making it so there's like light reflective tape or something that you can put on it or uh yeah stuff to make it more visible so that if it is a possible safety concern people can know hey maybe not hit here <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that popped into my head um with the, the um the hearing concerns or like mm -hmm. hearing impairments the actually i feel like having a set of standardized like hand motions to kind of indicate different portions of the battle would be good overall. Um, all types yeah, of exactly. like, yeah. Yeah, especially because in like melees, there's a lot of sound going on, especially in heavy combat. Rapier a little bit less because you're not hitting wooden shields with wooden swords at very high speeds and strengths. Um, but having like, and you might not be able to hear everything because of all the clashing. Um, though holds usually are called pretty easily, but having like maybe a standardized thing of being like, hey, okay, so you might not be able to hear me, but like basic sign language or those kinds of things that they use um, in other Paralympic sports and things like that and accessible sports. I mean, we might want to try and draw a lot of our base guidelines for that though there aren't many integrated, disabled and able-bodied um, sports out there. Uh, the only exception I would believe is like on college level and high school level, professional level, they don't have it. You're kind of stuck to your own little groups, um, but the integrated like rules and stuff of, hey, this person is deaf or mostly deaf or at least hard of hearing. Here's how we um, like adapt to that so that they can do the same things um, or have someone who is able to advocate for that person if they don't say don't have their hearing aids in because you can't wear them in a helmet, um, then have one of their uh, friends or family members or whatever be the advocate for them so that they can help make decisions if that person can't hear or like translate or interpret for the other person. Um, 
even if they might not use sign language, uh, but just help in that term. Though if someone wants to be completely independent, then having set signals or like maybe the marshal stay in that person's peripheral so that they can see the marshal um, if they can't hear it or have someone who is on the opposite side of the ring from them to be able to be like, hey, you know, rounds over, it's a hold, that kind of thing if they can't hear it. Um, are there any, um, I know, like, I feel like Facebook is the only way people in the SCA communicate. So I'm going to say, <laughs> are there any Facebook groups for disabled fighters or something I, that you know? I don't know. I need to double check. It wasn't when I last looked, but, um, I would love if we could maybe get something like that, like started up or something along the lines where it's like an accessible SEA experience kind of thing where people who are disabled or no disabled people in the SEA can have like a Facebook group because that's the main thing with the SEA, um, <laughs> communicate or share ideas um, on how to make stuff more accessible. That would be amazing. I don't think there is one. I haven't seen one specifically for like disabled fighters. I can check again, but okay. yeah, I mean, like I said, especially if we want to start standardizing rules, getting like a form or a survey or something for a bunch of people who do fight or want to fight for disabled or, you know, have mobility issues or stuff like that, um, that they can fill out and be like, this is a good idea. This isn't, or this would help me, but this wouldn't. And mm -hmm. getting a base standardized rules from a wide perspective, instead of just one person being like, this is how I do things. And that's how everyone should do it. <laughs> so. Were you, I think you may have been in um, Jan January at the, the DEIB symposium, from the uh, on tier one that uh, there was somebody from Lecoq who has done, maybe you know, maybe it's one, of, it's actually one of your campmates from Penzik who had done a survey. Of, oh. um, was this a, a basic survey of people in uh, in the SEA? I think that she did it early in 2020, early in 2020 or late 2019 to try to get like demographics of people in the SCA and they might be some, I think that there's some information in that about mobility issues. So mm -hmm. I'll find her name, but I recognized her from your camp because you <laughs> yeah. people. Um, so maybe there might be some information already about that, that we can draw, you know, at least statistics. Yeah. You need statistics and data to be able to yeah. start from, and, you know, I guess that's how this stuff works or one of the ways yeah. this so. Yeah, no, that would be awesome. Just, I want to try and start standardizing this stuff because it's not a thing right now. It's like, a lot of the times it's a case-to-case -case basis where if someone has to fight this way or wants to fight this way, then they'll have their own guidelines, but have, but then they have to explain it to every single person who is marshalling them and then they're fighting with, and then sometimes even the people around them or the like, top uh, head marshal of the event and they have to explain it and get approval from them and sometimes they'll disapprove it because they don't think it's a good way to do it or you know whole other concerns but having a standardized like i said standardized rule system would probably help at least as a base point for people to go off and do their own thing and make it accessible for them um how would you like people to get in touch with you about about this I'm fine with Facebook or my email or, you know, contacting my mom or my dad. They, if you can't get through to me, they'll get through to me. So, <laughs> yeah. Great. Awesome. Any other questions? Kick it. Woo! <laughs> uh, no more questions for me. Uh, yeah, no more questions for me, but just thanks for thing. It was great. Yeah, thank you so much, Rose. I'm sorry I had to go back and forth, but uh, no, I it's fine. Really, really enjoyed it. So um, I'll stop recording. Mm -hmm. Okay.